Shawl that used to hang on the bedroom wall, pinned under the chin, adorned with a pin, and pulled into a twist. Reinvent the OJ Trube, make a poncho from a duvet, then you can be with Cousin Lee on Mr. Blackwell's list. The full length velvet glove hides the fist. This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. I was knocked out by our next two guests' performances in the wonderful Great Gardens, and so we've invited them here to visit with us. To introduce them, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Grey Gardens is a big hit for Playwrights Horizons. It's a terrific new musical about the um, uh, disturbing, grotesque, or rather terrifying uh, relationship between the um, Beale's mother and Beale's uh, daughter who lived in this dilapidated house in East Hampton. I'm sure you've seen the uh, very popular documentary, and if you haven't seen the musical, I urge you to go see it because it has two terrific performances by two actors we've seen in New York uh, many years who've always given us wonderful performances. Thank we are you. happy tonight to be joined by Mary Louise Wilson of Full Gallop fame. I oh. still remember that performance very well. <laughs> and the wonderful Christine Ebersole, who I always thought was the absolutely the best thing in that revival of 42nd Street Thank a few you. years ago. Thank you, Michael. Uh, can you, having playing these characters, you playing Big Edie, you playing Little Edie, how did their lives turn out this way? How did they wind up living together in this bizarre situation? I think it's always going to be a mystery, really, yeah. because I think other people in that same situation would have been able to get out. Yeah. And I think that's just sort of the endless conundrum about Great Gardens, and I think that's what makes it endlessly fascinating, not only in the movie, but also in the play, uh, because these questions never will truly be answered. And we should say, just for those who don't know, that they were uh, living in East Hampton. They had been wealthy once upon a time, but the father who made the money had run off, and so they were living mm -hmm. in feral, po poverty, they had no, destitution. They had n no money. And no. also, no money. I think... Mm -hmm. And no, no housekeeper and no way of cleaning right. house. They couldn't right. clean house. I think right. that they, <laughs> but they couldn't leave. They couldn't leave. Well, no, and I think it's partly because the house was part, so much a part of them. That house... Well, where the were mother. they going to go? Where were they going to go? Mm -hmm. right. uh, it was that way for the mother. And yeah. I don't think it's that uncommon that there are certain children who can, they just can't leave home. They're crippled, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, and the it's first... a symbiotic relationship, you yeah. know, and... Uh, but well, all they do is argue and carpet each other. Well, suppose I won't get out of here till she dies or I die. Who is she? I don't know when I'm going to get out of here. Well, why do you want to get out? I want another place to be Because I don't worse. like it. Any place would be yeah. much worse. Any place on earth. Yeah, but I like freedom. Well, you can't get it, darling. You're being a supported. Not all. Not that's um, not all they do. Yeah. No, I think there's this, a connect. They have a, a definite mm -hmm. connection. Yeah. They may argue carp in front of others. Mm -hmm. There's a com competition going on, but mm -hmm. I think they're very into. We're very in interdependent on each right. other. Mm -hmm. Well, the way the show is structured, the first act, mm -hmm. you, you play Big Edie, Big Edie as a young woman. You play. Mary Louise's role as a, mm -hmm. as a younger woman. Mm -hmm. And you get the sense that, you know, Big Edie, I think, has a line where she says, well, why would anyone ever want to leave mm -hmm. Grey Gardens? Mm -hmm. But all Little Edie does is she wants to leave Grey Gardens. Yeah. And, I mean, I wonder, is it, a, is it a crime of a mother against a daughter that didn't allow the daughter ever really to leave? Did the, daughter man the mother manipulate the daughter into staying? Well, that, again, I think is, is, a, is a conundrum because mm. she... Uh, it, it, was it that Edie was not able to to be independent of her mother, or is that her mother forced her to be dependent? It's it's really it, I think and in a life combination it's never of things. one. Yeah, it's a combination. Yeah. It's never one thing. It is never uh, one. Now thing. your book writer, Doug <clears throat> Wright, uh -huh. created a situation in Act One where. Uh, the mother, who's you, uh, destroys the relationship of her daughter with Joe Kennedy, uh, her, her uh, engagement. In fact, the engagement that did not exist. Mm -hmm. Joe Kennedy apparently had been one of her suitors, but not a fiance. That's correct. But he sets it up that the mother tells uh, Joe Kennedy that, that your daughter's a slut, essentially, and scares him off. So that he has, he makes an active act of the mother destroying the daughter's chances to but make a see, proper marriage. But I don't personally take it on on those terms, really. Uh, it's really a, a way of Big Edie showing the independent spirit of Little Edie 
and it becomes misconstrued into that by because that, by the, the close-minded because, Joe Kennedy exactly because <laughs> yeah. that was those those were the social mores of the oh, of yeah. the day. You could not be uh, well. See, I think even in, in a deeper level than that, you could not be an artist and no. be in that level of society. Right. And right. that's really what they wanted to be. That's really what they wanted to be. So yeah. they were really the birds in the in the gilded cage. Yeah, the yeah, mother was ostracized yeah. as a younger mm -hmm. woman because she wanted to be a singer. That's and right. she would uh, sing and the family just thought it was, uh, you weren't, it was like being a it. prostitute to be yeah. in, in the in show, in business. show business. That's yeah. right. Some things haven't changed. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Shut up, Bob. Yeah. But, and that's why I think East, I think that's why Grey Gardens was so important to her because that was yeah. the sanctuary. That was the place where she was free to be who she was. I said something uh, before we began taping I'd like you to um, expand on, if you would. Yeah. That. It's every woman's fear to become <laughs> Big Edie and Little Edie. What do you mean by well, that? Well, I, I don't mean to, uh, <laughs> to say, speak for every woman. Uh, the idea in New, in New York, if you're a woman in New York and you're single, you know, mm -hmm. you don't have a family, you think, oh, I could, you know, the fear there that you could become a homeless or a bag lady, you know, mm -hmm. it's there if you're, if you're supporting yourself. I certainly had that. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't think I ever thought, but I know people who, you know, you can't get in their house because of the magazines piled mm -hmm. up on the floor. I know a lot of pack rats in this city, and I don't know a lot, but I know there are. Mm -hmm. I, I feel Oprah like calls it. it compulsive hoarding. Yes, yeah. and look at all these people are in business with uh, going to fix your clutter. These women had come from several generations of money yeah. where there were always servants. They yeah. had absolutely no strategy to even know how Take to change the bed. Right, exactly. And so then mm -hmm. we see that, another... that, this, that, that they are just can't even yeah. wash mm -hmm. their clothes. Right, yeah. And y you, how did you study this role? Both of you, how did you study this role? Did, did you, you look at the film a lot? Oh, I think yeah. this is the best costume for the day. Okay. Amazing. She's Chana. <laughs> Yeah, it feels like it. So what was your preparation? Uh, well, I, independently of, of Doug and Scott and Michael creating this musical, I was out in Los Angeles, and a friend of mine who I was staying with uh, said, you got to see Grey Garden. So I rented it, and uh, I never stopped watching it. I became absolutely obsessed with it, and I really don't know why. I think partly because being an actor, you know, we observe behavior, mm. and it's endlessly compelling mm. of, of just about how they got this way especially when you look at those photographs of this uh, American royalty mm. you know they absolutely look like princesses so and beautiful. queens and and then to end up with like the trash all around it was yeah. just you, the cat relieving itself behind the what looked like a singer sergeant painting you know <laughs> of the mother it just is it's mind-blowing it's just yeah. mind-blowing so I never stopped watching it and then a year and a half later they called and asked me to come and do it and I already was so informed by it so it was just a, like this odd sort of uh -huh. cosmic thing. Did you see the movie when it first came out? Yes did I it, did. It made, yeah. it made it a big impression on you as well? Yeah but but uh, when they was, would call me I, I thought oh I, I can't do this. I, Why not? I don't know I, I, I didn't see myself as an old lady in a bed with a long white hair. <laughs> 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 uh, you know how we, we're in denial all the time. <laughs> uh, but I, you know I, I just thought well, well I don't know I, I you know and I was like that all along well, a song about corn I don't know you know <laughs> uh, but uh, I got with it yeah. I got with the program. Do you have any least. sense why um, this the mm -hmm. movie and indeed this musical I think to a large extent and these two women have such appeal for um, uh, gay men I mean this, <laughs> no this, idea. this documentary is a sort of a, it's become a, an important part of the gay yeah. culture because I think it's about the disenfranchised Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's true. Yeah. And uh, and I really think that that's why it even has a broader appeal than just the gay population because I think Americans feel disenfranchised, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and particularly now, and mm -hmm. no voice. I mean, I can't tell you the uh, response I get, <clears throat> you know, when the full-length velvet glove hides the fist. Oh, I yeah. mean, that gets, I mean, <laughs> yeah. people feel mm -hmm. really empowered by watching this freak up on stage, you know, Hoping, um, having talking lost it about all. Yeah. the mean, nasty Republican town and, you know, <laughs> all this stuff they can get you in East Hampton for wearing red shoes on a Thursday. I mean, the metaphor of that, yeah. of just, I, I think, I think it really, yeah. I think it really does speak to a lot of people. It seems to me that a real particular challenge, though, is that if you just have the audience walk away thinking of these women as freaks, no, they don't. But they then, don't. But, they don't they but that's don't. it. But they don't. They because don't. the audience is touched yeah. by their play. Yeah. And the audience you say there, but is, is, is connected to them in some way. Yeah. And you can't just sort of say, well, 
this is just an oddball situation. Right. No. You know? I, th yeah, no. I think that's one of the... It's a heightened version of a very common situation mm -hmm. that that many of us know about someone like that mm -hmm. or have but some of it in our life. But I think there, there are these universal mm -hmm. themes yeah. Yeah, that, are, are. that are just that are so beautifully Loneliness dramatized and, yeah. into, into this into this music and 52 mm -hmm. cats and fleas mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. and this so, interdependence of mother and daughter yeah. which yeah. is a very complex yeah a lot of uh -huh. uh, a lot of female friends of mine are, I had this friend the other night who was couldn't stop crying you know yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. a lot mm -hmm. of people they come backstage and they can't they're crying they have tears in their mm -hmm. eyes or they're crying or they can't stop crying yeah. <laughs> I'm wiping tears away from their eyes it's, so, it's become a repeat business show you know like Family of the Opera and Cats people are yeah. coming back I to see I have people that have seen Ray it like Gardens. ten times really they can yeah. get a ticket right any now. chance yeah. of a move to a oh, larger yeah. thing oh, oh it's yeah oh yeah <laughs> it's I'd say the airplane's in the air with the cargo it hasn't landed very yet good. oh very <laughs> good actually oh, yeah. well you'll be sure to let us know when Grey Gardens sure moves so that a wider audience can see this fascinating disturbing but um, very touching, I think, ultimately, musical. Mm -hmm. Mary Louise Wilson, Christine Ebersole, thanks for being our guest tonight Thank on you. Theater Talk. Thank you. I'll probably be an old maid until I die. I'll sit around with cats the rest of my life. When are you going to learn, Edie? You're in this world, you know. You're not out of the world. The days are gone when money grew on trees. The money tree came down with elm disease. But if I age ducks for my two bucks, I'll eat the cake I have and like it. I'll eat the cake I have. I'm very happy to have with us now a very old and very dear friend of mine. He has spent his entire life in the theater in many, many different areas of it. He's written a book about his life in the theater. It is called Supporting Player, My Life Upon the Wicked Stage. It is by my dear friend Richard Seff, who has been an actor, hmm. a playwright, an agent, a confidant to the Broadway stars all these years. <laughs> Welcome right. to Theater Talk. Richard. I've done everything but sell tickets. Yeah, right, exactly. But I'm young, I may still get to do <laughs> you that. You may still get a chance. Um, why the title Supporting Player? I mean, is it because you've always been sort of around the theater but yeah. never right in the center of it? You know, you may wonder how someone could spend 60 years of his professional life mm -hmm. in uh, one business, and, and it's a public uh, a profession mm -hmm. in which celebrity is possible, mm -hmm. and have totally avoided it. <laughs> it wasn't easy. <laughs> but I, I, I learned years and years ago to know more or less who I am and who I'm not. Well, I you mean, started out as, uh, as an agent, really, it, I mean, professional. No, I started out as an actor. Yes, but, yeah, right, that's oh, true. Oh, I had yeah. six years of it. Of acting, yeah, as I a kid, got, really. I got to Broadway, and mm -hmm. I got to do a national tour, mm -hmm. and I did a lot of television in the early days. I did a lot of radio, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. last days of radio. But after finishing a two-season run in a play that was a hit mm -hmm. and being offered another play immediately, so I was kind of on a roll yep, at the yep. age of 21 or two, yep. I realized this isn't what I wanted to do. Mm. And the reason I didn't want to do it is because uh, I loved acting, but I didn't like the actor's life. Mm. I was needy for stability, for structure. Mm -hmm. You don't get any of that in the acting profession. And so I looked around for something in the theater, because I love the theater. I always have. Mm -hmm. And uh, ever since I was first exposed to it when I was 12. Right. And so I looked around for something I could do in the theater that wouldn't involve running, going all over the country, trooping, traveling. And wondering where the next job is going to come Absolutely. from when the show closes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Paycheck, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <clears throat> and I found it. I didn't think I'd end up as an agent, <laughs> because to an actor, an agent is anathema. <laughs> you know, you're used to the cliches you see in the movies, the 10%er. Yeah. Turns out a lot of agents are much more than that. Mm -hmm. Some aren't, but many were. Mm -hmm. And it just happened, the phone rang one day, and somebody asked me if I knew anyone who'd like to replace Jim Merrick at Liebling Wood, mm -hmm. a small agency. And I had been looking for a job for nine months mm -hmm. after that play, Darkness at Noon, closed. I said, yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was getting into, but I thought, well, I'll try it. Mm -hmm. And it became a career. And who, and who were your clients? Well, in the beginning, there was nobody. At yeah. the beginning, I really started working in television, and I had to work with whoever I could find. Right, but when you established yourself as an agent, you represented oh. John Kander and Fred yes. Ebb. You represented Cheetah Rivera. Rivera and you represented Andrews. Julie Andrews. Yeah, and you Bob represented Goulet. Robert Goulet. Yeah, know, not a bad Linda sta Lavin and, right, and, not Norm, a, and, and Nancy Dussault. Yep, not a bad stable of clients no, to have. No, but that was after the age, the, the, I moved to uh, MCA. Mm-hmm. And MCA was so big that they had a musical theater department as well as 
a non-musical theater department. And I fit into this thing, and I didn't know much about musicals, but I knew I liked to go to see them. Right. And my boss was someone who handled the top mm -hmm. people, Merman, mm -hmm. Jerry Robbins, Bob Fosse, Dorothy mm -hmm. Fields, Leonard Bernstein, one after another, Adler and Ross. Mm -hmm. um, and I was his assistant. So that meant I did the servicing, he did the deal making. Uh, but he encouraged me to make my own little list of clients, and I did. And I was at MCA for eight years before it closed. Mm -hmm. the, I'll tell you about that another time. That was scandalous, but <laughs> it did happen. And so in those eight years, I had my little list of Cheetah Rivera's and John Candles. All of these people, at the, all of these people at the beginning of their careers. Oh yeah. Think. Now give Before us a sense. the beginning. Yeah, well, like give, us a sense, give us a sense of what you know. Little John Candor and Little Fred Ebb were were like back then when you first saw a little review that they did. No, not a little review. Yeah. They came to me independently of each other. They didn't know right. each other. Right. John came in with a musical that he wanted to write with James and William Goldman. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fred came in with his then partner, Paul Klein, mm -hmm. and merely played songs that they'd written on spec for the theater mm -hmm. in, a, in an audition room, you know, a little room we had off the, off the main lobby. And I really loved, you couldn't not notice the talent in those people. Yeah. So I had them both signed to agency contracts, both teams. Mm -hmm. It took a lot of years. You know, people forget how hard it is, no matter how gifted you are, to get started. Uh, I must have signed Fred to the agency in 1958 and John about the same time. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have a hit till 1966 mm -hmm. with Cabaret. Why did you decide they should work together, John Kander and Fred Ebb? What did you see? Because How they fit? needed collaborators. In other words, Fred was working with Paul Klein, but he couldn't continue to mm -hmm. because Paul Klein happened to have a wife and a, and a baby on the way, and he really needed a more stable life. Right. So he freed Ebb to find a composer. Mm -hmm. John Kander, on the other hand, had only worked with James and Bill Goldman. Mm -hmm. They were friends from boyhood, mm -hmm. but they really weren't librettists, lyricists. They only did one musical together, and then they went off to write plays and books on their own. Right. So John was in need of a lyricist. Well, I got one here and one here. Mm -hmm. You put them together. But, Actually, they were introduced to each other by their publisher, right. by Tommy Volando. Right. But I took Fred to see John's work in uh, John's first musical with the Goldmans, which was a family affair, mm -hmm. which was not a hit. Mm -hmm. And I remember taking Fred to see it one matinee. It was half empty. It was so sad. And he saw the show and looked at me at the end and said, yeah, I could work with him. Mm -hmm. Julie Andrews? Julie, I inherited. She yeah. came from London, mm -hmm. uh, where she had uh, been known for vaudeville, really. She hadn't done anything on the stage. Right. But the boyfriend was a big hit in London. Ann Rogers had played the role in London mm -hmm. of Polly, mm -hmm. but she didn't want to come to America, so Cy Fewer and Ernie Martin, mm -hmm. who brought the show to America, took a chance on this 19-year-old soprano, mm -hmm. and uh, when she got here, somebody had to look after her because that's how they did it. She was an MCA client in England. Right. So I inherited her, and what an inheritance. <laughs> really, you know, she was an angel. She, she sparkled was, from the beginning, right? She made me glad I became an agent by accident. Yeah. She really did. But i got to ask you, this, this book is full of wonderful anecdotes, things that you saw happening but backstage. But I happened, I was at all of them. None of them are hearsay. I know, I know. You were an eyewitness, unlike yeah. you know, the column I write, which is based on hearsay. <laughs> right. Um, right. But, you know, you've got a young Julie Andrews pitted against a Rex Harrison in My Fair Lady. Yeah, that came next. Right. And then that show is up in New Haven. Right, first first night up there, and Rex Harrison doesn't want to go on. No, even before it got to New Haven, Harrison complained. See, unfortunately, we handled both of them. Mm -hmm. That ain't easy. Yeah. My boss handled Harrison and Andrews. He made her deal because mm -hmm. she was still the star of the show. Right. But I was her again, her associate agent, right. and I was with her a lot. So uh, in the middle of rehearsals, uh, Harrison says to his agent and to the principals off the record, I can't do it with her. She's a 20-year-old girl. I've, this is Shaw. She can't play a Shaw heroine. <laughs> she has no experience. Sings very nicely, but can't act. <laughs> well, she had other things going for her that he didn't notice, like <laughs> tremendous appeal, yes. you know. And Moss Hart believed in her implicitly. He was the director. Mm -hmm. So he did close down rehearsals, you know, for three days. Rex Harrison, yeah? No, uh, Hart. Hart, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just canceled them. Mm -hmm. Took her off to the country where he had a farm with mm -hmm. Kitty Carlisle, his wife. And, and uh, they spent the weekend rehearsing alone. 
because her only problem was that even though she was English, she had a little problem with the, the Cockney part of the role. Right. K Katie Carlisle told us that Moss gave her line readings. There you that go. Weekend. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, now I learned something. But uh, they did come back from the weekend, and she went into rehearsal, and we never heard another complaint again. Again. Yeah, but now, after Rex Harrison's complaining, you're up in New Haven, and all of a sudden, Rex Harrison is struck by great fear and well, doesn't want to go on. Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> see, what Julie, happens? Julie had been singing since she was 12. Right. She knew what an orchestra was. Right. Harrison had never, ever been in front of an orchestra. Yeah. And so after four weeks of rehearsing with a piano, he gets to New Haven and they throw an orchestra at him. And at the final tech rehearsal on the Friday night, February 3rd, 1956, <laughs> I remember well, um, he rehearsed in front of an orchestra and he panicked. Mm -hmm. He couldn't hear them. He said, they can't hear me. It's insane. So, of course, we have to cancel the first preview. And Moss, uh, Herman Levin, who produced Fair Lady, mm -hmm. wanting to keep his star sane, because mm -hmm. it was two in the morning, mm -hmm. agreed. We'd cancel the first preview. But, of course, he didn't mean it, <laughs> because it was sold out. And you can't tell 1,100 people to go home, <laughs> right. because the star is nervous, right. you know. So, um, it just would happen that that day, Saturday, February 4th, 1956, <laughs> a day written in here forever. Uh, it snowed uh, all day. And by the time we got there at 6 o'clock, David Hocker and I, summoned by Herman Levin to be there as early as possible, but we couldn't get there earlier, mm -hmm. we had to walk from the train to the theater mm -hmm. because the snow was so bad. There was nothing on the street. Ah, Eureka, yeah. And we get into the lobby of the Schubert Theater, and four people descend on poor David Hocker. Uh, and they all say, look, listen to him. He was rehearsing, Harrison was. He was singing, I've grown accustomed to her face. And it sounded fine to me. Mm -hmm. and, and, and David went up into the balcony and listened, and, uh, and he could hear him. Mm -hmm. And it was all going well. They all descended and said, you've got to tell him. He has to understand. We have a sold-out house. He thought a preview meant we invite a few friends. <laughs> but that's not our problem, you know? Right. Then the house manager said to David Hawker, look, you're all being very polite and very tact tactful, mm -hmm. but I'm telling you that if that son of a bitch doesn't go on tonight, I am telling every columnist in the world he didn't do it because he was, had stage fright. The Walter Winchell threat. He said, you go home a week from Monday. I'm here all season. Right. I've got uh, subscribers and customers who come here. I'm going to tell these people who came here in a blizzard that they paid for the babysitter, but you've got to go home because the star is nervous? No. <laughs> so they said, well, if he won't do it, we'll let the understudy play it. Chris Hewitt will mm -hmm. do it. They don't come in a blizzard and leave the babysitter home to see Chris Hewitt, all due respect. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my poor boss had to go backstage and reason with this man. And but practically succeeded. threw him out of the dressing room. <gasps> really? Yeah, he said, I want someone up here representing me, not them. <laughs> but David Hawker, when he told him the bottom line was, if you don't do it, I think the press will be funny. So he did it, but he insisted Moss Hart make a speech, telling them there'd be a disaster. <laughs> uh. And Moss Hart, who was a charming man and, yeah. and so, so wonderful. He did come out at 8.30 and say, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Moss Hart. I directed this play. I want you to know Mr. Harrison and Miss Andrews are in perfect health. Everybody applauded, meaning he wasn't there to tell them that one of the stars was out. But he said, we have some problems. We have two turntables that misbehaved very badly during the dress rehearsals, and they may well stop entirely tonight. And he went on to say, we have other technical problems, but you mm -hmm. people know about previews in mm -hmm. New Haven. You've all been here before. Mm -hmm. So come along and let's see if ah. our fair lady can't enchant you. Very and smart. they all applauded, and off he goes. <laughs> and of course, it went like and, and the rest out is, of hell. And the rest it is. ran four hours. It ended at <laughs> one o'clock. Right. And the rest is history. It became one of the greatest shows of all time. Absolutely. Yeah. And you were there for that and so many of these other, other wonderful uh, uh, stories and parts of the history of, uh, of, of yeah. Broadway. It's all recounted in Richard Seff's book, Supporting Player, My Life Upon the Wicked Stage. Uh, one last question, Richard. What's the key to uh, keeping happy your whole life in Don't the get theater? famous. <laughs> <laughs> You've succeeded admirably until no, tonight, no, I'm afraid. No, one quickie I'll <laughs> yeah. say is really, if you, uh, what I think the book tries to say, and it doesn't only apply to theater at all, mm -hmm. is that if you're lucky enough to do what you love, 
then it's been a great success. Yeah. And I really feel it's been a, a, a good life in the theater. It's been a wonderful home to me. But I think the, a, a good gardener can say that. Yeah. Or a good accountant can say that if you really like the numbers all through life, you know? Yeah. That's Excellent. my speech. All right, Richard, supporting <laughs> player, My Life Upon the Wicked Stage by Richard Seff. Thanks for being our guest tonight on Theater Talk. Always a pleasure. Bravo. Pleasure. Thank Bravo. You. Pleasure. Thank you. And that's the revolutionary costume.